Welcome back, everyone. In order to understand the current situation, we need to look to the past. How has this safety regime evolved? To learn more about the regime's history and development, we've invited Mr. Paul Bang. He has been working with the PSA and, prior to that, the NPD for over 30 years. He's a lecturer at the University of Stavanger within the areas regulatory development and HSE management in the Norwegian petroleum industry. Moreover, he is also engaged in regulatory matters in the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation through their programme Oil for Development. This programme offers assistance to developing countries in their effort to manage petroleum resources in a sustainable manner. Please welcome Paul Bang. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for that very nice intro introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today and to try to give you a more oversight and, and uh, insight of actually how our system is, how it became the system we have today. Um, I will take you on a more reflective journey going back in time, but also reflecting as is in time and try to think about actually how these attributes with our system has, be, has evolved and, be, and, and, be, and been like uh, today. As Heidi said, I'm, I'm lecturing also for students and I keep, uh, always keep saying them that most likely most of the things that I'm saying today, you will forget. But some of them you will remember. And I will urge you also to download the, the presentation, because many of my slides has a lot of, uh, uh, have a lot of information. And some of these information, it will be impossible for me to go deeply into the details. But the information is there. And if you get uh, some teasing thoughts, you can go back to those uh, uh, slides and you can start to read and remember more. So that is uh, uh, what I urge you, download and see the details while I'm talking or afterwards. So what I'm going to talk about is the, 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 more, the historical view of, of, of uh, uh, the Norwegian system. And uh, Sigve this morning it was starting with whether our system is unique or not. And that is uh, impossible to, 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 to conclude on that matter. What I used to say is that a lot of the elements in our system is, is uh, more internationally recognized and used. But one aspect which uh, Sigve didn't go into is that the cultural, the government's culture and the culture uh, in, in uh, the specific countries are different. So when you take these more generic principles into your own context, you probably will come up with a unique system. To copy one thing from one, one country to another can easily be a disaster rather than help. So, so that's why how we, uh, how we run our, uh, our uh, system is unique but most of the principles are well known, as you will hear when I proceed now. I always start with a kind of reflection. What is oil and gas about? And are there any differences? Here you see a picture of the oil and gas in, in the Northern Hemisphere, and what you see is that you see a lot of technology, you see a lot of, of, of offshore activities, and uh, you don't see all the bad weather, but I can tell you it, the weather is also harsh uh, during winter time. But this is the Norwegian reality. If we go to the next region, uh, we will see that in the Middle East, they produce a lot of oil, but the circumstances are very different. You see the flaring of the gas, you see the, the, the guy with a gun, and you see a lot of, of onshore facilities. So that is the Middle East. If you go to Africa, you will have a third kind of picture. If you look up left there, you will see a land-based camp in rural Uganda, 
And if you go down at the, at the right corner, you will see that guy sitting on the beach in Angola, uh, looking out to the, to, the, to the platforms. And also you see the local uh, community issues, the children there, you see the oil in hands and all these things. These are realities in, in Africa. Interestingly, there is a forecast uh, uh, towards 2050, and we all know that we have a lot of attention to climate and to, to, to green initiatives, uh, but this forecast uh, uh, towards 2050 is concluding that the, we anticipate that the three main regions for producing oil in 2050 will be Africa, it will be the Middle East, and most likely also Russia. What we are doing in Norway is that we are transferring a lot of what we are doing into more gas. And uh, if we are going to make uh, uh, this green, uh, green uh, initiative come through, we are looking at the same players. It's the big in oil, oil and gas, the uh, players, the big multinational companies, they need to change. So they will move from, from fossil into to green uh, type of energy initiatives but they will be the same, and we will see them all over the world. I'm quite sure of that. But oil and gas is about a lot of things. If you look at this, uh, 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 you will see that a lot of impacting aspects comes into this picture. Politics and governance, culture, religion, and values, knowledge, innovation, and technology development, and down at the bottom, you see the, 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 the green circle of the natural resources we are trying to utilize to the best for the country. All these white boxes you, uh, you look at here, they are essential. And they are attributes for bringing this kind of, of system into to, to, to good business for the industry and for the, uh, for the individual countries. You will see here that you have a lot of different type of, of, of attributes. And uh, I, will, I will try to emphasize uh, at the right side there, the knowledge, innovation, and technology development. And you see it's coming into the green one. It's coming into the other one. It's so, so essential. The, 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 the tools at the bottom, well, they are obvious. We need to investigate accidents. We need to use audits. We need adequate follow-up of industry performance. We need all these things, but also we need the rest. And I will take you through some of the aspects of this. I will start here at the, at the very first and look at why do we regulate and how do we regulate. And you see down this list, we have the purpose of regulation, we have the politics and interface of passage of power. These things Sigve was into, and I will go, try to go into to a to, to little bit more deep into to, to them and, and look at, at uh, co uh, uh, courses in historical perspective. If I'm going to make a kind of a generic starting point from actually how you should govern any kind of, of area, this will be more of the state of the art, the way we do it, and which is also very, very internationally recognized. Government ruling, and what is the prerequisites? Uh, uh, and you will see here that we start with policy laws and delegations. Uh, we will go to the bottom, because that is the most important part of it. Any area we want to regulate, we need to have a clarified understanding. Actually, what is this area about? Then we can turn to the left side here and see how do we regulate? What kind of, of strategies uh, and, and, and uh, framework should we put forward? And you see that the uh, bullet point two there, it will all, always be a consideration. Competence and capacity. What should we, the regulator do? And what should the, the, the industry or should we use competence from other sources? Like the third party. We know that around the world, a lot of third-party consultancy are, are doing work from gov for government and for the industry. If you go to the right, you will see the enforcement. Again, we need, as we were into in, in, in Sigvis' presentation, uh, 
the, the equivalent type of, 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 of capacity, competence, within the government and within the industry. Why is it so? Why do we need it? And I will try to, to, to follow up that. We can easily also outsource that to third party specialists. Many countries around the world uh, adopt to that way of thinking. So, clarified understanding. What is oil and gas about? Uh, what are the core disciplines? You will see in this uh, cloud a lot of, of words, and you will probably uh, be able to add in many more. But those are, uh, th th those are core discipline areas, which we will meet when we are diving into to oil. Uh, some of them will go to the left side, and some of them will go to the right side, and some of them belongs to both sides. It's for a, for, for, for a uh, government regime, you need to con consider what is the important aspects and where do they belong. You will see at the left side that those that naturally fall into the consideration of economic values will end up as resource management matters. And those who is more into uh, to protecting values, they will end up with a safety management. This is the thinking. And back in time, as you will see shortly, we had a lot of discussions going on to reach where do what discipline belong. So this is part of a an, of an development over time, as you will see. Also, uh, to, to, to uh, bring back what, what uh, Sigrid was into, Development, what is the, the levels of government? The, the ministry level, the political level, the ministry level, and the, what I call the subordinate level. More generically, you can see these three elements. Development framework and regulation, as Sigve says, that is directorate function. Professional advisory body for the ministry to have the competence needed for the ministry to take the decisions. That is also part of it. Supervision, follow up the players, and dissemination of information and guidance. So, so far, easy. This is more a generic approach. So, but when you then introduce what kind of principle you use, then you are more into choosing what you want to apply. And if you see, we have done that, and this came by after f nearly 20 years of development in the industry. And they are here, the core of them. Sigrid was into them. Application of regulatory requirements, which focus on purpose and functions. Not specific uh, requirements, but more broadly purpose and, and, and functional based. Expert to expert collaboration. I will come closely into that with the industry, both when we are, we are developing standards, but also when we are following them up. And the, the, the focus on risk, which has been increased since the, the 80s, we will also uh, uh, come into that. And the three-partite, which was uh, uh, comprehensively uh, covered in, in Sigve's uh, uh, presentation. Then we have the attributes. I call them the uh, uh, attributes. We can call them characteristics. We can call them uh, with different names. But the, the confidence and trust. And I know if uh, some of you out there are, are uh, listening from other countries in the world, this confidence and trust is very, very difficult and has a lot of, un, uh, of uh, d different opinions into. And uh, that we need to think, how can we adopt to such a principle? And I will try to give you some answers to that. Uh, collaboration, an expert to expert dialogue. It is like this. If, we, if I am talking to a wise guy or a wise uh, la lady, we are discussing a subject. We have never seen each other before. But when you start this, if you are doing a kind of a problem-solving discussion, wow, this, this was an interesting, some of those views, very interesting. It's a, this is a generic thing happening between people with the same level of knowledge. Because we are, 
we are, we are looking into to, to things from a different angle, from our own personality angle, and we bring in something into that discussion, then we inspire each other. And when you do that, you also are learning. And there are some elements here which we, we need to try to take into the follow-up um, uh, strategy we have when it, as a government towards uh, in the industry. Um, the risk-based intervention and, and, uh, is, is, is very, very uh, highly focused and, and uh, it also makes us able to have a, what I will call a, a tailor-made use of instruments. And Sigve said that our strategy is to go as low as possible down that ladder of using instruments uh, to achieve what we want to achieve. And the collaboration, uh, not only within the tripartite, but also we have a lot of, of uh, collaboration with the, with the academia, the research institutions. We want to, to develop knowledge, new knowledge, and use knowledge all the time. So th those are the attributes in our system. So uh, by this more introductory type of, of thinking, we are going into the history. This is uh, the historical uh, map. Uh, and it starts uh, a, a little bit late, so to say, because uh, the drilling, the exploration drilling started in the 60s, but uh, the first field was found in 1969 and, and came into production in 1972. It was the Ecofisk field, which is still the, 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 the largest uh, offshore oil and gas field in the world. Uh, we established uh, the, the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate in 1972 and also the Econor, uh, the uh, Statoil, uh, the, the, sta uh, the state-owned company was established at the same date. Then we had uh, resource and safety going hand in hand, as you see there at the left side, but some nasty disasters turned up. One of them, the Bravo disaster in 1977, uh, was uh, more an environmental uh, disaster. And then we had uh, the Alexander Chelan uh, with the 123 fatalities, which I will come into, in 1980. These were shocking events for, the, for, for, for Norway, and uh, it, it created a lot of political noise, discussions, and so forth. The outcome back in 1979, 1980, was that uh, we separated uh, the two uh, main considerations. So uh, economy and resource management should be handled by the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy, uh, and uh, uh, matters of, of safety should be handled by another minister. The minister, uh, not to com uh, compromising the minister's responsible area, we, 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 we divided it into two different uh, uh, ministries. So then we had a long, and uh, still we kept this, the, the, the agency, the NPD, and we had a long, uh, happy marriage uh, reporting to two ministries from 1980 and up until 2004. Where, where we followed the development and further, and we, we separated the two institutions. And then it's very clarified that the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs is the Ministry for the Safety and, and uh, the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy for the NPD. The other things to say here is that if you look at this slide, we had more than 200 fatalities in the pioneering period from 72 and up until uh, 1980, 85. Um, and then after, you see, we have less than 10 uh, fatalities. Um, I need to, to uh, add to that, that uh, we have had more fatalities uh, with the transport, the helicopter transport back and from uh, the, the offshore has a lot of fatalities, but that is another area of, 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 of responsibility, aviation authorities. So if, if we add them in, we have more fatalities also after 1985. But still, there is a huge improvement. And what is the main reason for that uh, improvement? We, we will try to look into it. Let me just briefly uh, 
tell a little bit of the pioneering period. And as Sigve said, that was another regime. The, the thinking was very, very different back in the, uh, at that time. Uh, and, and what we do, what we did, we, we borrowed in. We, we were starting this business from scratch. There was no one there to tell us actually how we should do it. So we had to borrow in and customize uh, whatever was out there to be used. And also in, uh, import principles and guidelines from international sources. Uh, the very first uh, uh, people coming was the American, uh, the US Americans coming in with, uh, with the rigs, of course. They, they, they arrived with their culture and their way of, of, of thinking and how they were, were looking at this business. So it was a kind of a adoption. We needed to learn from them and uh, shortly after they needed to learn from us. That is the conclusion of that. But as at the bottom here, you see that the regulation appeared to be fragment, fragmentary and complex. And I will show you now some details, which uh, you don't, we, I, I don't want to go into, uh, into each and every, but, but uh, they explain the picture. Because the, the, I, as you see in the, in the middle here, I call it the legal jungle. There were so many things in there, with the use of instruments, type of regulations, how we use them and how we use them differently. And on the left side there, you see all the subordinate agencies in Norway at that time, they all wanted to have a piece of cake in this new business. Uh, so so they, were, they were fighting for, for positions into the system. And they started also to make, they make their own uh, regulations. But at the bottom, you see, we were influenced by major disaster. And then I need to turn your attention to the right side, because things was happening around the world also scientifically. Uh, and these four science areas is very, very important for actually how we came by with this new way of thinking. Legal science was starting to flirt with the ideas of coming from descriptive type of thinking to more principle-based or functional purpose-based. Uh, so that already had started. Engineering uh, science has started far before, particularly in the, in the, in, in the um, uh, car industry in Japan and in the US, where they started with these autonomous teams and, and started to empower the, 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 the staff uh, to increase production. And these, these ideas was coming into what you see here, the quality assurance and, and, and management, and also that if you, if you empower your staff and give them autonomy, that is a very, very uh, good motivation source. So they will be very motivated. That is the, uh, the root thinking of, of, of applying this type of thinking. Organizational sci uh, science started also with this goal setting and planning uh, type of, of activities, which was coming into to a more uh, goal-based planning. And uh, the Norwegian government, they initiated in 1987 uh, a document uh, and, and, and uh, with, with this uh, activity, uh, goal setting activity planning, and this was, uh, was um, uh, applied by most agency around in the governance uh, uh, during the late 80s and, and, and beginning of the 90s. And then at the bottom there, the economy science principles. We have borrowed in this audit thinking from them. They, they have been applying aud uh, audit uh, principles far back in time. Uh, and of course, all of us know that uh, this is the nature of, of economy to do so. But what we did, we, we borrowed in and we made it into our own context. So we, today we apply this audit uh, system and this is highly recognized in, in, in international standards like the ISO, as you probably, uh, most of you know, and uh, the ISO uh, 9911 elaborates on how we should uh, use the audit or uh, audit planning and, and uh, management system thinking. So 
This is one slide with the details I told you about. You see, these give an overview of all the regulations which was uh, developed throughout the time from, from uh, early 60s and up until 85. And you see, it's a lot of different royal decrees. We call it in Norway because we, we, have a, we are a kingdom. So, so, and those were developed throughout the time. I've red circled the, the NTB, uh, NPD because that is not a, a framework, but that it, 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 give, uh, it plays us into the picture. So we were established in 1972. And we started to use those royal decrees coming by in 1975 and 1976. Still in the old-fashioned way of thinking. So we, we, have not, we, we, we haven't reached the, the paradigm shift in 85 yet. And here, again, I will not go through the details, but if you look down this list, it's a lot of approvals, permits, permissions, and submissions of, of a lot of detailed documents and all these things. This was the daily life throughout this period. We were very, very uh, focused on details. And our inspectors were out on the rigs. Often they met inspectors from other, other uh, uh, agencies without knowing about each other. We were controlling and we were doing a lot of, of, of uh, government work but we were focusing on the details. I've just brought an example, and because this phrase, consent, is very, very important for today's framework. What is a consent? Consent has a lot of under, uh, understanding and association to it, and, and we need then to clarify, what do we mean by a consent? And I will do that. This is uh, from uh, the Royal Decree in 1975, and uh, you see that it's very, very dif different uh, phrased from what we do today. In ample time before drilling is commenced, the licensee shall submit to the ministry um, description of the platform together with the necessary drawings and specifications. Nothing should be left here, you see, all the details. And then in the next, uh, you, will, uh, you will see that the drilling platform is put into service Consent for the use of the drilling platform needs to be, to, to, to be obtained from the ministry. So this is the first time we meet this, this phrase, uh, consent. Today, we look at it more like this, because the reason why we use the consent is explained by this uh, view graph. You see, the responsibility area goes all the way for, for, for the activity at the top, and then we, we, uh, we need to look into what is the responsibility for the, for the um, uh, uh, responsible party. And by approving thing, if I go to the bottom, if we approve something, then we are taking part in the considerations. We have a co-responsibility because we are approving. So what we wanted to do, what we would expand that uh, thinking to remove us a little bit from taking part in the responsibility. That is, is put to the, to the player himself, and by giving a consent, he needs to, to have the, 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 the total responsibility. And we are just looking into that he is capable. It also has, has a time schedule uh, often. If we give a consent, we, we, it's, it's starting and it's, it's ending somewhere. So this is also things coming in. So by using this consent system, which is a very, very essential part of uh, our regulation today, we introduced a new understanding, which now is adopted and, and, and perceived by, the, by uh, the industry. So. To, to end with this, this uh, um, uh, summarize the use of, of the early phase, regulation, they were comprehensive, complex, and unclear, and unsystematic and incons in, inconsistent. Maintenance was resolve intensive. Technolog uh, technological developments were delayed. Uh, transfer of liability to the authority. 
by going deeply into giving approval, giving permits and all these things, we also took on a liability which we shouldn't. And limited ability for the risk assessment. And at the bottom, we summarize because that, this is, uh, creates a counterpart culture. We all know that uh, executing uh, uh, authority is, an, is asymmetric in the sense. And this is uh, it's easiest to capture when we meet a policeman. What the policeman says, we need to follow, eh? because that is very, very asymmetric, and we, can, we, we, we can't start to argue with him. If you run your car 20 kilometers over the limit, you, start, you don't start to argue with the policeman that uh, you didn't, because that, this is the fact. And what you need to pay is what you need to pay. So you see that this as, uh, asymmetry will always be there, but we can deal with it. I'm quite sure that we can find ways, and I will show you how we have done that in our thinking. Major accidents. As Sigve's first video showed us, has had a, a major impact on how we think uh, in offshore oil and gas. And this uh, explains a little bit of how it can work uh, badly for, for, uh, for someone uh, experiencing it. You see the Alexander Chelan at, at the upper right corner, and imagine it took 20 minutes to do these sequences from the first uh, breakup of the leg until it was up down. 20 minutes. And most of the uh, people killed were killed when they were in, 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 in their cabins inside the platform. So you see, there is, if this type of, of, of accidents occurs, it's, it's a very, very nasty story, which also this led to. Um, so, this is one of the most important events to make this paradigm shift happening in 1985. Prior to that, you see at the left side here, we have a, we, in Norway we have what we call a, a, a government research. It's a kind of an investigation, but it, it's more an, an, an professional outline of what's, what's uh, happening. And this was done uh, during the first years after Alex Alexander Chelan. And this document is 350 pages. And it goes deeply into actually what happened and was pinpointing uh, a lot of things which we had to do something with. And it was particularly pinpointing that all these different agencies taking part into the follow-up, that was confusing. And things could pass out from one uh, to another, and then you can then the, the responsibility was not taken care of from from the government as good as it should be. So what it ended it up with, you see, it was that uh, it was a lot of of uh, uh, work being done prior to to uh, uh, launching the Petroleum Act in 1985, and uh, we were ident identifying what kind of principles from resource management, from safety management, should come to the law level. Because if you start at the law level, well, then you need to emphasize these, these major principles. And um, uh, again, uh, co-players was the, the thing at the right side, all these science, because the uh, uh, research community was also very, very actively working after uh, Chelan to try to come by with the best new solution. And then we also need to look into that small red book there, because that was a, the Working Environment Act, which was coming by in the late uh, 70s. And all of us uh, uh, knows that we have had an ongoing um, worker protection uh, research and, and development far back in time. And this was coming into the law in Norway in 1977. And if you read some of the bullet points here, they are directly influencing that, the regime that we uh, established in 1985. Um, I will just point to some of them. Uh, rules for the Organized Health and Safety Protection Service, uh, uh, prudent working environment, 
new arrangement for processing disputes and termination of notice and dismissal. The whole thing here was that the, 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 the parties in working life was coming together. The employer got more, more responsibility of involving the staff. These created the processes which we were, uh, were uh, building on when we, when we came to 1985. This one is a complicated, uh, but it's an easy to explain. Because culture and values cannot be underestimated. And out there, where you are coming from and where you are living, cultural aspects is very, very important. And I can, I can say that if I try to expand a little bit from Norway, we can see the Nordic countries, which is Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and, 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 and uh, Iceland. We are very common in, in our thinking. And uh, what I state here as the Nordic model of welfare, we, 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 we execute our social democracy in a way that these core elements is part of it. So that is part, and it's, it's, it's rooted in our, our, uh, our, our personalities as core values. So they are, of course, very important uh, as, as uh, uh, explanations for why we have de developed the system at the right side there. Development of confidence and trust, and uh, expert to expert dialogue, and uh, this equivalent uh, competence and expertise thinking, which we have been in, and I will also come back to. So, trust. How do we build trust? When I give my lectures, I always keep saying that, that um, there is one basic element which we need to have to start a process of building trust. And I always keep saying, uh, if, if, if we have a daughter and she's, she wants to go to a party when she's six, 16 years old and she comes in to the parents and say, well, I will go into this party, I will, I will be back tomorrow. And uh, most of us will then be, wow, what is happening here? So the only way of trying to give her that permission is if we can trust. And coming back to the basic, we need knowledge and insight. That is the only, only element of building trust. So how should we apply this into our system? Well, I, I call it the expert to expert uh, interrelation or, or conversation or, 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 or uh, dialogue, whatever we use as, as, as the, the last word. And this is exemplified here if we, um, if we um, uh, uh, review uh, constant to exploration drilling. And in this case, it's Equinor submitting an uh, uh, exploration drilling application. Then we review it. And you see down at the bottom here, as part of the handling of application, professional to expert, expert to expert dialogue normally will take place. And coming back to that, the drilling engineers in, in PSA Norway, the drilling engineers in Ekinor, they have the equivalent capacity, and of course, they are more concerned about the core drilling aspects. And by doing that, they will also inspire each other. They will start to ask questions. They will influence each other. This is generic, as I said it at the start. This will come by automatically. And if you do that, you will come by also with new ideas. And you can use those ideas. And then we link the other very, very uh, important aspect, namely the continuous improvement. If you start such a conversation, you will end that and you will leave the room. You will have a little bit more knowledge and poss possibly you also can, can convert this into improvement. Same as for the emergency preparedness. This is just an example. But the key thing here is that you need the equivalent type of capacity and competence. You don't, you don't develop the same thing if, you, if, if, if you're talking to one who don't have the clue of what you are talking about. Well, then you can give up immediately. So this aspect of, of the common level of knowledge is so, so important. So, how, coming back to what I say initially, uh, we have these two main considerations. 
coming into economy, economy and resources and coming into uh, uh, safety and, and health and environment. And what we did very early on, and I know because I'm traveling around the world that this is not adopted in, 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 in uh, uh, all countries, but you see here, I call it the ring fencing. We were ring fencing the oil and gas and then we started to regulate that as a sector. By using that, you will see from the coming slides, that gives you a lot of possibility, but it also gives you a lot of dilemmas, which you need to solve. And uh, we started in 1972 with the NPD, Norwegian Petroleum Directorate. There were four, four people at the very start. And there were three in, in Statoil, by the way. So seven at all in two offices started back in 1972. At the very beginning, there were one dealing with the resource management, and it was a, a, a legal uh, a lawyer, and then also a mechanical engineer. And they were starting there, and they were trying to find out actually how should we develop this agency. So I've gone through the annual reports from 1972 until 1980. That's why you have these figures. And uh, each year, we were arguing for getting more and more expertise into the organization. By 1980, we had increased from four to 200. And from, two, from 1980 to, to up until we split it, we were nearly 400. And very, very early on, you see at the left side, these core elements of resource management was in the, I came by and was identified as core resource management issues. And on the left side, you see the same areas as Sigve mentioned in his uh, uh, presentation. And they can be discussed, they can be argued, uh, because when I'm traveling around the world, many, when I come into the drilling, drilling and well technology, is that something with the resources or is it something with the safety? Well, we, it's a lot of opinions around this, but more and more uh, recognized around the world, we look at drilling and well technology from the safety point of view, most likely, because there are so many aspects which is so important for the technical operational safety that that's why it belongs there. And we can go through the other areas and you will see this, the, the, the same type of discussions. Uh, the structural integrity, pipelines, are they, is it midstream? Is it downstream? Is it upstream? Is it part of the resources? It's not. All these discussions. But in, again, internationally recognized, they are dealing with, with technical operational safety issues more than the resource. So that's why it has come, uh, it has come by, by such an understanding, which is now applied throughout the world, so to say. The other thing we need then, because if we are handling, if we are handling economic uh, regulations, we do it differently than uh, social regulations. The follow-up is normally from, uh, from uh, uh, economic values, it will be reviewed by a professional subordinate uh, agency. The specialists are there. They will review and then they will uh, they will, uh, will give their advices to the decision-making level. I have never come uh, by any uh, country in the world uh, uh, which will, will, will delegate authority for the economic decision-making to a lower level. Never. So that is handled by the, the ministerial level or, 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 or uh, at parliament. When it comes to social regulations, the picture is different because if we want to follow up safety, we need to be there. We need to, uh, to monitor, to, to overview, to see what's happening. And to do that, we need also to have mandated power. Because if we are there, we are looking into something, well, we, action may be needed there and then. So then you need the instruments to, 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 to use sanctions or, 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 or uh, other type of, 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 uh, of uh, instruments. So that's why we need these mandates. And at the left side, you see that in this relationship 
between a ministry and a subordinate level, there is two types of, 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 uh, of mandating an advisory function, which is that directorate function, as uh, Sigve said, and then it's the mandated, which is the, the supervisory tasks uh, an agency execute. These principles need also be considered and established in the right manner. Since 85, we have had a lot of development. Uh, how decision making takes place when it comes to regulation, the, the making processes as such, who should write the regulations? Well, it's one answer to that. If you are, if you are, if you are drafting, uh, drilling uh, regulations, what kind of capacity do you, you need? Of course, the drilling expertise you needed. But hand in hand with the judicial, because we, we, we need the lawyers also. But mainly, these technical regulations need to be drafted by technical experts. Also, the risk and risk management, which is the cornerstone, the most important cornerstone for the oil and gas, how you treat risk. And unfortunately, I, I haven't got the time to go into that, but all of you listening knows the, the importance of it. And at the bottom, again, this stakeholder involvement, which also mainly came by after the paradigm shift in 1985. So, what kind of options do we have? Well, I've already been into this police type of, of, of following up. Uh, that is what I call the command and control. Uh, the police approach is uh, to be protector, uh, protector of law and order, and then you, con you control. And this is anchored in, 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 in uh, uh, deeply rooted in history, and it has been applied for thousands of years. And uh, also, this asymmetrical dilemma, as I was uh, telling about uh, uh, initially, is very, very relevant for this type of follow-up. And then on the other hand, you have the facilitator, as I call it, the principle-based type of regulation, which uh, look at government more as a service provider, stimulating towards growth, and also give incentives to, to take on to the responsibility and develop good solutions. And this is more asymmetrical. Still, these asymmetrical uh, principle, principle is behind the mirror, but we can act in the daily basis because we have this equivalent type of, 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 of uh, capacity and competence. Let's look a little bit further. Because if you use that type, the facilitating approach, you also expand your possibility for the follow-up. And you see here on this slide, um, checking of the obligated parties' compliance still is there at the left side. The controlling aspect is there and needs to be there. But we have expanded because the influencing through expert-to-expert -expert dialogue, then we can use elements to, pro to promote learning and to promote the continuous improvement, which we heavily use in our, our auditing uh, thinking. And then also we can go to the far um, right here, and we can try to, to be a driver of compliance. An example of this is the uh, automized uh, drilling deck. We had a lot of accidents, falling objects and, 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 and manu manually handling drilling deck. And then we started to push the industry in the direction of getting an automized uh, drilling deck. And it was so noisy, so many uh, complaints. And, 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 uh, but as we, as we, uh, we, we uh, developed and evolved, this thinking came more and more into, and today we will not, we will not even think of having an oil uh, exploration rig without an automized drilling deck. So this is just an example. So, command and control, this, uh, or the, uh, the, the facilitating or the, the, the performance-based thinking, as Sigurd was into, and his, here is the kind of, of, of development, uh, the trending in that. It's an international trend to adopt to these uh, type of, of, of uh, regulations, um, and, but still we need to have both. We need to keep on with the prescriptive. If we are talking about emergency preparedness, we need, we need to have 
prescriptive rules. If something is happening on an installation, of course you need to be on your post immediately. There is no room for discussion on that. Or if you are handling very flammable uh, chemicals or whatever, you need specific rules. But if you, can, if you can drag most of these things to the right, where it's applicable, you use it. So it's, it's both and, and not either or. So this is probably my most important slide, because this is telling why we, um, why we uh, developed the management system thinking. Before, 90, uh, before uh, early 80s, no one knew about management system. No one was thinking about management system. But here, when we changed the, the legal setup, because if we are having specific rules, we will concentrate stretching our top of our head just to the, to the line of compliance. And all our energy is actually to develop that compliance, to reach that on, on the cost, most cost effective. If you go to the right, if you give uh, scope and choice for identifying relevant norms, if you give some alternatives, well, something will start to develop. Because then you get alternatives. And when you get alternatives, you want to administer. And if we look at all species in the world, if you have a lot of choices, you will, you will try to make your best choice. It's as simple as that. But it creates also a need for how you administrate to get that cho best choice. So by introducing that, you need to administer yourself. Privately, if you're, if you're buying a new car and if you're buying furniture or whatever, you don't rush to the shop and buy the first one. You need to optimize your and you start to do the research. This is a generic aspect, and this creates the way of thinking into the management system. As soon as you do that, you, are, you have changed. And this was the main change in 1985. This is just an example from our regulations. And you see this, I, I, I don't want to read it through, but it says a gas release system, and it says, shall have, shall prevent, so that it doesn't say a single detail how a gas release system looks like. I don't know how a gas release system, and I, I don't get any wiser by reading this. But you see, if you supplement that with a non-legal level, you can go into the standards and you can find all the details needed. So when you need to document compliance with this regulation, the company needs to look into it, they need to look into the standards, they need to decide what kind of alternative, and they need then to document to us. This is the compliance of such, such uh, requirements. So this created a new alliance between uh, regulator and those being uh, uh, regulated. And uh, if we look at the bottom, which I will em emphasize here, to have such a system running this, these two uh, bullet points are fundamental. The enforcing body must be given the right to have the insight into activities. I can't trust anyone if I don't have the insight. So, again to the drilling department within the PSA, they need to know what the drilling department, uh, department in, uh, in Ekinor, what they are doing. They need that insight. If they do that, well, then they can trust and have confidence to what they are doing. So this is the essential way of thinking. And to do that, every single player needs to, to uh, provide this insight, either by direct interaction or by submitting documents, documentation. The last one also is a very, has a dilemma, because we don't, we don't want too much documentation. So we need to be very carefully when we are documenting one thing and, and submitting it, because you can drown people with documentation nowadays. So this system applies all over uh, our framework from the very top. And this is what I've, I've, I've uh, tried to exemplify here. So at the law level, when we put the requirements in the law, we will go through that right side uh, that uh, uh, 
uh, considerations, could it be principal performance based or should it be specific prescriptive? These two th these things we need to have bear in mind. Whatever we are doing when we are reg doing regulation making, we should always go through this loop of thinking. Uh, and on the secondary level, we elaborate what's on the uh, on the upper level, and then we will also use the same way of thinking. And as I said, with uh, as as being coming out of the example, we need also to look into the non-legal level. Uh, Sigurd was touching upon it, I will also touch upon it, because development of standards and norms are very, very important, because whatever we do, we need to find the details somewhere. And to have those details, we need also to stick the, our head together, which we have done when it comes to, to work out of, of standard, uh, standards, both on the international and the national level. So. Um, what, was, what happened in 1985? Well, we had a new law, and I will show you two main principles in that law, and we have a major shift in regulation, which I will show you, and we had the systematic involvement of, in the tripartite stakeholder management. Those was the main principles introduced. And this one, again, is a difficult one, but let's start in the, in the, in the upper right corner. When we are regulating, Everything is important, but something is more important than everything, which was the basic thinking back then in 1985. And you see, what we did was that we, 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 were, not, uh, we were not drafting a complete set of new regulation, but we introduced two main regulations. One about the consent system or the safety, how they deal with the safety, and the other one with the management system, the management internal control principle. Those were the two. And then at the right side, we also introduced a new supervisory regime, reducing all these uh, uh, subordinate agencies down to, to three at that time. We are now four because we have split it, the MPD and, and, and uh, PSA. And then we started to pay extensively attention to the non-legal level, develop of guidelines and, and, and uh, standards. So this was the new thing. And by raising the principle to the law level, that, that, that was a new possibility was coming out of that because we could emphasize some of the main principles uh, as very, very important. My time is running, so I can't read through all uh, the, this, this slide, but I have blued out and you see uh, this was, the, this, this, this was uh, what we were aiming to, to do. They should be more, more flexible, focus on management, liquidation of detail, highlight uh, responsibility, and so forth down the line. We have mentioned some of these, and uh, these, this is one slide which you can go deeply into and, and read afterwards. Um, that, uh, Sigweb was going through uh, all the ministerial uh, minister ministries engaged in the oil and gas, and of course, that is while I'm concerned uh, about uh, turning off uh, fossil fuel in the debate of the climate debate, because uh, the, 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 the fossil fuel, uh, the, the, we should rather put attention to how we can produce and use fossil uh, emission free than, uh, than, than believe that by, by throwing it away, we, will, we can proceed with the same welfare system as we have today, because we can't. So, but, Still, there is a lot of, of, of interest in uh, the oil and gas. So, by sectorizing this, um, we, we introduced two agencies. And you see this sectorized. You will see that two of them are entirely working within the oil and gas sector. The other one, which was mentioned by, by Sigve, is, is outside. But still, they touch us into the sector. And to do so, we need then to make up uh, agreement with them. So we know what they are doing, and they know what we are doing. But the two main entities is what you see in the middle. And when it comes to the, to the technical operational safety and uh, occupational safety and health, this is the picture. We have the Ministry of Labor, 
which counts 210 staff. Uh, in PSN, we are 185. And then we have some sisters at the, uh, uh, we have a National Institute of Occupational Health and we have a Norwegian Labor Inspection Authority, which counts 600, so they are very big. So, and all this system, we are taking care of, of, the, uh, of the safety part. Technical safety is, uh, is, is, is anchored in this definition at the law level. And, um, you see here what we were expanding the understanding by including also financial values, which uh, Sigve was into. And that is very, very important for, uh, for, for the view of how we perceive safety today. The other element which we have not touched that must, uh, much uh, upon is this duty to see to it, which is anchored in the, at the law level and which give extensive resp responsibility to the players. And if you read at the bottom, operator shall ensure that everyone who carries out work. So he can't escape any kind of responsibility. That is for sure. How much time do I have? Some five, ten minutes? Okay. Um, regulatory development is an ongoing process. The moment you introduce regulation, you need to start to think actually how you should renew them. Because the development, the technological uh, development, the dynamic in society makes it, uh, makes it uh, uh, important to, to have this continuous change going on. If not, we will lack, we will, uh, we will be delay the development or, 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 or uh, lag back. So, uh, to develop the system, which Sigvis said was recognized widely uh, from the last work we had with the report to the parliament, uh, this is widely, widely recognized. And then we also have need to have the work on the non-legal level, as described here. We call it the good symbiosis. If we sit together with the industry, you can see at the bottom there, we get invol uh, involvement in, in the regulation. Uh, for the government, we, we get involvement when, in our legislative work. We get exchange of expertise and we get access to competence networks. The industry, they get influence, uh, predictability and competitive advantage by knowing to the core the regulations. Now I'm summarizing and uh, this uh, to today's system is a coordinated follow-up and you see that we are the, the one gate contact to the industry and we coordinate with other government entities. The green one are supporting us with the uh, competence and capacity, the white one have independent uh, authority. Uh, we have a joint set of regulations and that is very, very important that everyone can, can identify with that, uh, those regulations. Then we have the collaboration, the stakeholder management, uh, which I will expand a little bit from the three party, because the three party is, is the employers, the employees, and it's the government. But we also have the research community. And in many sense, we do a lot of, of uh, uh, collaboration with them also, because they are, they are providing knowledge and break, uh, often a breakthrough uh, coming uh, knowledge, so we need to have them to, to be updated what's, what's happening. So that they are also very important. I don't want to go uh, through these three partite uh, arenas. Uh, you have the, a little bit more details here than you had on, on Sigvis slides. Uh, and you can read, and uh, he didn't pinpoint uh, the, the third one here, which I always do, uh, the, the working together for safety, because that is an initiative entirely taken by the, by, by the companies themselves. We only are their observers. If you go into their web page, you will, you will have a lot to learn because they are, they are, uh, they are uh, making uh, a lot of videos and they are making recommendations and there are so many good stuff for, for, for uh, uh, companies and, and people to learn from, from their web page. So please do that. So. By then, a little bit rushing, but I managed to get to the end. Eh? You did very well, Paul. 
Thank you so much for your detailed uh, description of uh, both the, the historical aspect and also the development of the regime as such. I do have a few questions for you. Oh, please. Um, we do have a lot of uh, viewers from other parts of the world with us today. And based on your uh, experience from petroleum activities around the world, how unique and different do you regard the Norwegian safety regime uh, from other countries and petroleum regions? Uh, very interesting question. Uh, I was touching upon it at the, at the beginning. Uh, my answer to that is that um, most of the principles, overall principles, they are highly recognized internationally. But how you execute those principles in your own culture and your own system is unique. Mm. So in that sense, how we have taken this into our thinking is unique, but how we how we use them. They are there. Some of them we have exported and some of them we have imported, as I see it. And let me just bring an example. Uh, Sigwe was elaborating a lot about this three-partite. Um, what we have done is that the EU, all the European countries, have adopted this. So they use this principle nowadays, even though you, 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 you can't go... Uh, you, you, you don't need to go uh, f uh, further than to UK and, and this partnership between employees and employers are very different, but still they can adopt a kind of the thinking. How they, uh, they execute it, well, that is another yeah. question. But I know that, that uh, around the world, all the countries, all my friends, with, if they, they're listening to me, uh, I, I've tried to, to convince them that not the uniqueness uh, we are having in Norway, but the generic principles should be applied. Yes. You also mentioned in your presentation you focused on the, um, the importance of the stakeholder involvement yeah. um, as an important element yeah. in succeeding. How do you think this thinking could be adopted into other regions? Yeah, um, coming back to my, the end of my presentation, how systemized the three-partite uh, collaboration in Norway uh, is, it's very difficult to adopt to other countries. So you shouldn't look into that. What you should do is that you should start the stakeholder mapping. Who are the stakeholders? And what kind of role do they play into the business? And how can you involve them to the benefit of the government and for the business? So pay attention to it. And I have some examples from, from Africa where I introduced, they don't have the same uh, same same uh, thinking, but they brought together the companies, uh, the em employers, and the government in a new setting. And my, the feedback I got was that this was very fruitful. So you can, by doing this exercise of mapping your stakeholders and considering how you can involve them, is very very important. Thank you. I'm also curious about the um, the key. Uh, elements, confidence and trust that are crucial for this regime. These are very difficult aspects to develop on a general basis. Mm. Do you have any advice on how to initiate processes, drivers, to accomplish this? I hope that everybody, everybody listening to, me, to my, my presentation have captured the, what I, I, I said about uh, how we should uh, interact to create uh, uh, confidence and trust. And just a warning, whenever you are introducing, from a government point of view, whenever you are introducing or, or in, uh, initiating a discussion with an oil and gas company, make sure that you have the equivalent capacity. Because if you are talking to someone mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and, and, and you compromise yourself, well, that is not good for the confidence and trust. So, to have this expert to expert, to, to, to target uh, and have the discussions, a wise guy with a wise guy, that is the, the, the bottom line of creating trust. That's the way forward then? Yeah. Okay. Finally, I do have a question for you, Sigla, if you join us up here. Yes. Uh, an area of interest for many of our viewers is yeah. the current situation with the ongoing pandemic yeah and a relatively low crude oil price. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. How do these, or do these contextual aspects have an impact on our supervisory role and yes. dialogue with the industry? Yeah. Um, it's been much about the pandemic lately and, uh, and also in relation to, to, to safety. And it's, it's something new, both to, to plan and to, and to manage safety in a pandemic, in a context of a pandemic. And I think, first of all, everyone had to do their internal uh, considerations uh, and taking care of uh, our own people. Uh, and we were, of course, thinking about that with the new rules, the kind of new rules for the game, uh, with uh, with safe distance, with uh, uh, intensive hygiene uh, measures, home offices and things like that, digital meetings and also digital work processes. So I think everyone has been through that uh, and also found their way uh, in, in that new landscape. And then came, of course, the external considerations. How can we perform our job and how can we do our job in this context? And, and, and what measures are the companies out there taking? Uh, in the beginning, we had, we had to cancel some activities, of course, just to, just to be able to, to uh, rearrange and replan. Uh, but we managed to replan and, and take uh, into use uh, new technology, uh, ICT technology to a much larger degree than we had uh, planned and to a much at a much higher speed than we, we, we actually had planned. We were on our way, but we got a really kick uh, and, uh, and, and had to implement it uh, uh, rather quickly. So I'd say we took some giant steps like many of you probably have done in digitalization and from March to, to, to till today and we have reduced traveling to a minimum. Uh, we have uh, increased digital uh, ways of performing supervisory activities and also tripartite collaboration. Uh, most of it is on video uh, at the moment, but we do also perform uh, necessary and crucial audits in, in the good old physical way. Um, Today, we are more or less actually on track uh, according to our original plans for the year. Uh, although we, had, we have changed the way of doing things. Uh, and uh, we have some really good experiences and we also see that we, there are something that we, we lose uh, in this way of working. And um, we, of course, um, it is you, you lose the things that you get when you are physically on, uh, on the field uh, and on the installations and talking to the people and seeing, uh, seeing the technology and seeing the state of, uh, of the maintenance and everything. But we can compensate for some of that with the video and, and also with uh, video meetings and video inspections. And, and uh, that's where we are and we have to take that into, uh, into consideration and into account and that sort of forms the picture at the moment. Uh, it's not 100%, but in some areas it's, it's, we have developed and, and are more efficient. And in some areas we are feeling that we, yeah, we, are sort of, we have lost some, some, some senses that we had earlier. And, and we, yeah, so we, we really want to come back to the normal uh, days mm -hmm. and, and be able to take the best from the COVID period and the best from the, from the good old days and, 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 and continue uh, supervising the industry in the best possible manner. I'm sure we'll pull through. Thanks. To uh, close off this seminar, I'd like to uh, thank all of you viewers out there for following us via the streaming. Special thanks to Sigve Knutsen and Paul Bang for providing us with their increased insight into the regime. Their presentations are already available on our website. Please also remember that you'll always find relevant news, updated regulations, and information about upcoming events on our website www.psa.no. With this, we wish you all a pleasant afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>